Now, this morning, I've entitled the lesson that, that you may know. And I want to look at Luke chapter 1 at verse 4 to begin. Luke chapter 1, and I'm actually going to read Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4. But uh, I want to pay special attention to verse 4. Luke 1, starting at verse 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. As Christians today, as those that have been obedient to the gospel of Christ, I, I, I think it's a sad thing that sometimes there are, uh, uh, among our days, those days where sometimes we feel like we're not enough. We feel like we haven't done enough, as if there's something that we could do to merit salvation. And we know that. We know that we have God's unmerited favor, uh, his grace. We know that we are covered by his grace. We're told so in the scriptures, but on the day-to-day -day where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, in our lives, sometimes we get ourselves wrapped up in the things that we've done. And we, God has let those things go that we have repented of and turned away from. But sometimes we don't let those go. And I wanted to look at this here today. You know, I know that uh, for the past uh, few weeks we've been on a series of, uh, of church uh, leadership, elders and deacons, and we'll get back to that. But I thought today we'll take a break from that and we simply want to look at the hope, that solid rock on which we can stand. I actually texted Mike last night at like 10 o'clock, uh, probably woke him up, and asked him if we could sing that song this morning. And he was so gracious to, to do that uh, for me, uh, and I thank you. But uh, as we uh, sang that song, we, we should realize that our hope, it is built on nothing less than Christ. Christ is that solid rock on which the church should be looking towards. We should make that our foundation of our lives. We should be able to know that we, with certainty those things which we were instructed by the scriptures. But as I mentioned, sadly, many today do not feel forgiven. And we need to overcome that feeling. Now make no mistake, make no mistake, there is a uh, condition to God's salvation. You must be obedient. You must do what he's asked. But in doing those things, make, make no other mistake that those things that he's asked of us, that they are of some value such as that would save us in and of themselves. It is by God's grace and his grace alone that we are saved, that we have that unmerited favor. But we must understand that if we believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God, then of course, as I've often said, then we must be obedient to him. If you really believe he's the Son of God, why wouldn't you do the things that he's, that he's asked? But on that same note, if we believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God, why don't we trust him enough to save us? Why don't we trust him enough that his word is, an, is enough. When he tells us, when he tells us that he has covered those sins and he remembers them no more, why do we continue to go back to those things? We need to be confident. We need to study the scriptures often, daily, that we might have that hope, that we might be able to teach others that we might have that confidence that we can go out and with certainty teach others. You know, when you're training a dog, if you get a puppy and uh, you're training them, if you're afraid of that dog, you're not going to train them very well. They'll sense that. They're going to sense that fear in you. But 
The same thing happens when we go out there and we are sharing the gospel with others. If, we, if we're not all in, if we're not, if we're not uh, convinced ourselves, if we're, if we're just doing lip service to the scriptures and we're not, we're not certain ourselves that we are saved, then that's going to be something that people sense. You know, how do we overcome that feeling of inadequacy? The number one thing we need to remember is Christ. Let's look at some ways that we can deal with those feelings of inadequacy. That, those ways that we may know. One thing that we certainly can do is to build our faith. Our faith needs to be built. You know, there's that point when you're studying the scriptures in the beginning, when someone is sharing the gospel with you, or maybe you've opened it up and started to study for yourself seriously for the first time and make no mistake the word of God is able and it will prick your heart and you start to gain that faith and you realize that you know what this is this is the real thing and and I need to be obedient to the gospel of Christ you make that confession and you follow through with that obedience you turn away from those old things that dragged you down but that's just the beginning we have to continue to study. We have to continue to build our faith. Romans 10, 17 is, is often uh, mentioned from this pulpit. Uh, one, one of my favorite verses, I suppose, because it so perfectly tells us how we can become more faithful, how we can get rid of all those butterflies in our stomach that, that, that I'm not enough. And Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Do you lack faith? Do you find yourself having those doubts? Then read the word of God. Then put your mind into the word of God. Put the word of, my, the word of God into your mind. God's word tells of his pardon towards his children. Don't let seeds of doubt be sown in your heart. You know, I think one of the saddest things that you can see in the world today as a child that has beaten, been beaten down by abuse, has been told that they're not enough, been told that they're nothing, that they'll never amount to anything. Uh, and sadly, I've seen that in, in my life. I've seen those that I've been around, friends that were told uh, if, by their parents, by their teachers, that no, you're not going to do that. You, you can't do that. You can't possibly be smart enough to do something like that. And that's a very sad thing. Well, Satan knows that, and the world beats down on us, and they constantly tell, tell those that would believe that, oh, God's not real. God didn't make this, make this earth. God didn't make you. It was just happenstance. And we get that doubt, those seeds of doubt in our, in our mind, and we cannot let those grow. Don't let those seeds of doubt be sown in your heart. Put your mind into the scriptures. If you have been obedient unto salvation, you can rejoice like the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts 8 at verse 39, what happened when they went down into the water <clears throat> and they came up out of the water and the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. <clears throat> this salvation that can be had in Christ is something that is worthy of of rejoicing. It's something that when we wake up every morning, we should rejoice. We should be thankful. <coughs> thankful for that wonderful gift. Romans 8 at verse 16 <coughs> says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. Who do we put ourselves under the control of? What do we put ourselves under the control of every day? Have we built our faith so that we may know? Or do we allow ourselves to flounder back and forth <coughs> between some doctrine of man, some thought, some feel-good thought of mankind? Or are we being dragged down by sin surrounding us? 1 John 1 9 simply states there at the end, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 
He is faithful and just, and we must never forget that. Do you have faith? Today, if you find yourself <clears throat> lacking in faith, if you find yourself feeling those feelings of doubt, then you need to study the scriptures. We would be glad, of course, uh, those of us here would be glad to study with you and to share the gospel of Christ with you. If you've never heard those words before the gospel of Christ, if, you've, if you don't know what we're talking about when it comes to uh, the obedience, we're going to get to that. We won't leave you hanging there. But we would love nothing more than to share the gospel with you. But for those that have put on Christ in baptism, for those that have been obedient to the gospel of Christ, we also must ask ourselves, do you have faith? Is there something more that I could do to bolster my faith? Can I change things in my life so that I'm not dragged down by sinful things and the, and the, the world around us that so easily embraces sinful things, things that are not of God. We also must confront sin so that we may know. If we are to know that we are confidently saved, we have to confront that sin in our lives. We have to realize that, that uh, we falter from time to time. We must be honest with ourselves and with God. We alone can do nothing. Many times, as we've already sort of alluded to, many times I think that we think that we can do it ourselves. You know, there's that common, if you're an independent person, and, and many, many of us are independent people, and sometimes, you know, sometimes you just get that feeling, well, I'll just do it myself. You know, you ask your children to go do something, and they, and they have trouble with it. They don't do it the way that you want to. So you say, well, I'll just go do it myself. We've all probably been there and said that. And when we're struggling in, our spirit, in the spiritual realm, when we struggle to understand how the Lord could save such a wretch like me, then wait, maybe we tell ourselves, well, I'll just go do it myself. I'll just make sure I'm a good person. I'll make sure I do good things. I'll make sure people uh, think highly of me. And, and I'll make sure that I'll give to the poor and I'll do all these wonderful things. But you alone can't save yourself. You need the Lord. And we must be honest with ourselves and confront those things in our lives that are sin so that we can do something about them. The Lord is able. You know, the first step is always recognizing the problem. You know, thinking back to middle school when you learned the scientific method. You know, the first thing that you have to do is identify a problem, isn't it? You have to identify the issue that you want to tackle, that you want to study and learn about. Most 12-step recovery programs uh, start out with that, that idea of recognizing that you have a problem, admitting that you have a problem. That kind of knowledge, that kind of wisdom is out there. And, and it first started with the Lord. All these other things, the scientific method and, and the... Uh, 12-step programs and, and all those self-help books that tell us the, the very same idea. You know, through observation, they understood that this is truth. And the Lord started that. The first step is always to recognize the problem that we have in our lives, the problem with sin. Then we have to do something about it if we expect change to occur. I've used this example many times, and maybe those of you that are used to listening to me are tired of it, but I, I remember that as a child, turning on the television, most likely on Saturday morning, there was a commercial for the Crystal Cathedral in somewhere in California, and Robert Schuller would say, don't just sit there, do something, and he'd pound on the pulpit. Now, Robert Schuller... Uh, you know, the uh, make no mistake, I'm not putting him up on a pedestal for his beliefs and teachings, but that stuck in my mind, that idea that you must do something. You know, as a five-year-old or whatever sitting there watching television, um, that stuck with me all these years. And it's true. It's not true because he said it, it's true because God said it. 
it's true because we understand from the scriptures that we must do something. Proverbs 28 at verse 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. If we are to obtain mercy from the Lord, we have to do something in our lives. We have to confront that sin. We have to recognize that we have that problem and we have to do something about it. And again, we point back to the scriptures. The scriptures, it is our handbook. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is contained therein. Now, if we are going to have the comfort of the knowledge that we are in a saved condition, for those that have been obedient to the gospel of Christ, we must continue in repentance so that we may know, that we may have that solid understanding that we are saved. Now, godly sorrow is an ongoing state of mind. It's not something that you you just say, okay, yes, I'm sorry, and then you go on and do the same thing over and over again. That's not how this works. Godly sorrow is an ongoing state of mind. It is not not a one-and-done operation. We we know from Revelation 2.10 that we must remain faithful. We must remain faithful until death, and then we will receive that crown of life. We have to continue to turn away from those things. You know, repentance is that turning away, having that that new purpose in your life. So you turn away from those sinful things. And that's something that you have to wake up and do every single day. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You know, when we, uh, when we get ourselves entangled in the world, when we become dragged down by those things that we see and that we experience in the world, when we take our focus off of Christ, that solid rock, when we put our hope in something else. You know, we've spent the last year and a half, and it's something that I've observed, and, and, and maybe you have too, is that we are in the midst of a, a world full of people that have put their hope in men. They have put their hope in science. They have put their hope in the thoughts of mankind and the things, the concoctions that mankind can, can come up with. And yes, of course, we should go to the doctor. Yes, of course, we should listen to doctors. And yes, of course, we need to take care of our bodies. We need to do what we can to be healthy. And, and medicine is a wonderful thing. But let's not lose sight of our focus. Our focus is heaven after we get out of this place. It is not how long we can prolong the sorrow of this life. The Godly sorrow is something that we must have. And that repentance, it necessarily leads to a change in our actions. When we have repented of something, we are turning away from it. We're doing things differently. We're putting our hope in Christ. Keeping our eyes focused in his direction. So that we can go through all of those, the the valley of the shadow of of death, if we, if we uh, to, to use a quote. And as we go through those hard times, as we go through those difficulties in life, we keep our eyes focused on Christ, we have nothing to worry about. That's what the Lord's focus was when he was walking amongst men here on earth. His focus was on the will of the Father. The will of the Father is that all men come to the knowledge of truth, that all men be obedient to the gospel of Christ. And that was, that was the, the, the thrust and the focus of the Lord's life here on this earth. And in the same way, we also must do the same thing. We are raised when we are baptized. We are raised to walk in a newness of life when we are, when we are baptized for the remission of sin. In Romans 6 of verse 4 we read, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness 
of life. That newness of life is possible. That newness of life is possible if we look into the scriptures and use it as the pattern for our life. Then our life will be new and we'll turn away from all those old things. You know, and part of it, if, if you look at the, uh, at the bulletin today, and I hope that every one of you can pick one up on the way out if you don't have one already, there's an article there on the back of the bulletin page. And it talks about, you know, when I wasn't there in the assembly. And one of the things that, the easiest things that you can do to help build, build your faith up is to do what we're doing right here now and come together. It's no mistake that the Lord commanded that on this day. And it is one of the easiest things you can do to come together with other believers and to look into the scriptures and to be built up by the scriptures, to be built up by the fellowship that we have one with another. And that is sort of a, a charge, uh, a shot in the arm for, for me I know every week to be able to, I look forward to coming to be with you each and every Sunday. It's a wonderful thing. I, I really look forward to this Thursday when we can come together for the first time in a very long time in person to study the scriptures on Thursday night as we have been accustomed to for so many years. And in this last uh, year and a half or so, we've found ourselves doing you know, the online, and I'm so happy to be back in person, and, and, and I encourage you all to come and join in with that study on Thursday. It helps us to continue in this repentance, in this new focus in our lives when we come together with one another, when we follow the Lord's plan for his people and his church. We need to continue in these things. We need to obey the gospel of Christ, so that we may know. You know if, we, if we understand if we have done what the Lord has asked, then we can have that confidence. We can have that peace that passes all understanding. We can have that peace that when we turn on the news and we hear that the sky is falling, that we can rejoice because we have a hope greater than this earth and what surrounds us here. Remember 2 Corinthians 7 uh, verse 10 at the beginning, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. When we turn away from sin, when we have that godly sorrow, it produces a change in our lives. It's more than just an I'm sorry. It is a new purpose, a new goal in our lives. We must bear fruit worthy of repentance as Matthew 3, 8 tells us. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Have you taken action to separate yourself from sin? 1 John 3, starting at verse 19, and by this we know that we are of the truth and, are, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, beloved if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And there you have it. How can we know? How can we know? How can we be assured? How can our hearts be calmed and assured before him? When we know that we have kept his commandments because we've looked into the word so that we may understand his commandments. And we followed through with those things and we do them. We know that we are pleasing in his sight. Today I ask you, can you say that yes, I've been pleasing in the sight of the Lord? Can you say that you have put on Christ in baptism? Can you say that yes, I have that hope of heaven after this life? And we have a great and precious promise in Christ. We know that uh, in uh, 2 Peter uh, 1 at verse 4, it says, By which we have been given, has been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We understand that we can be heirs to this promise. We understand that on the day of Pentecost, 
Peter said to them at verse 38 in Acts 2, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified in exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Now, can you say that you've laid hold of that promise? Have you laid hold of that promise? Won't you have that peace that passes all understanding in your life? You know, we're told in Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. That's what we're all looking for. That's what the world is looking for. It's peace and that calm. They're looking in the wrong places many times. But we have the right place right here in the scriptures. We, have, we can have that hope of heaven after this life if we just obey his word. Are you subject to Christ's invitation today? We understand, we've already looked at Romans 10, 17, which tells us that we must hear the word of God. When we hear the word of God, then we gain faith. We understand that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. We believe that he is who he says he is, just like the Ethiopian eunuch believed and made that good confession. And then uh, we must repent and turn away from our sins. And we've talked about repentance already today. It's that new purpose in our life, that turning our back on sin and having a new goal. Focusing on the Lord. When confessing Christ before men, just like the Ethiopian eunuch did, he was not ashamed. We also must not be ashamed, must confess Christ before men. Be baptized for the remission of sins. There are many, many religious groups out there in the world today causing confusion. They, they're calling uh, baptism, you know, sprinkling, and, and they, 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 do, they do baptism for also many reasons from membership to a local congregation. But the scriptures tell us that we are baptized for the remission of sins. Most importantly, because God said so. It doesn't matter if you understand why you getting into the water and getting wet, what that actually does. But we know that God said so. It's what he desired for us to do. And we must do it. Have you been baptized, buried in the waters of baptism? Have you done these things? If not, then we can make that happen for you today. If you have, then I bring to your mind again Revelation 2.10. Have you been faithful? Have, have you faltered off the path? Do you need the prayers of the saints? That's what we're here for. We're here to be a support to one another. We are a family. When the ties that bind us to our earthly family, the blood relations that we have, the close family members be, that we have because we were born into that family physically, when those ties fail us, we have a greater family amongst the Lord's people, one that will never let us down. We have the church. And we should use that. If, we need, if, if you need the prayers of the, of the saints, if you uh, desire that we be able to help you with whatever issue you may have, then by all means, let it be known. We have an opportunity this day. You can change life for the better right now. Come forward as we stand and sing. Would you be free from